Nehemiah chapter 11. Nehemiah chapter 11. Make your way to the book of Nehemiah. I'll say it directly for those who stay in the afternoon service. It's always an enjoyable service to me. Uh, I've enjoyed our study thus far, and um, we're getting very close to the end. Uh, believe it or not, I don't anticipate, I could be wrong, and I reserve the right to be wrong. Uh, I don't think the rest of this book is going to take us uh, near as long as chapters 8 and 9 did. Um, so we, we are coming close to the end uh, here of this study. We'll try to get through this chapter today, and uh, I'll spare you my mispronunciation of, of these names. Uh, so we'll, we'll read just a few verses and kind of uh, sort out the rest. Nehemiah chapter 11. As you make your way there, we'll return to the Lord again in prayer. Dear God, I come to you this afternoon very thankful for the opportunity that we have to gather as we always are. Uh, so thankful for your wonderful word and more specifically as uh, we have been studying through the book of Nehemiah, we're very thankful for this book and you have preserved it, uh, the history of your people and that we could see uh, how your people really are to function. I understand a lot of the uh, a lot of the details and the specifics have, have changed and, uh, by way of your new covenant, but that the principles are, are still identical, that you are an unchanging God, uh, that the way that your people are to approach you is, is, is unchanging by your work. And, and so we can see that, that we are to have structure. We can see the importance of leadership. We can see how to lead. Uh, we can see the necessity of the community of believers, and, and that is a message that has just been so prevalent throughout the study of this book, the necessity of our unity and our contribution, all, all pitching in to the work of the kingdom of God. Lord, please press upon our hearts a desire to contribute to that, the fullness of that body, uh, that we as individuals can, can identify ourselves in, as a citizen of heaven, as a member of the body of Christ. Lord, help us in our endeavor to serve and to run the race that you have set before us, that we would do so with patience, that we would do so with endurance, and that we would continue to have a desire beyond just the stirring up of emotions, that often as we would sit and, and spend time in your word or listening to messages being preached or songs being sung, that our, immersion, that our, our emotions would stir. And that's all perfectly well and good, Lord, you created us with those emotions, and we thank you for the good ones. Uh, the Lord help us that, that our endurance would last far beyond just the stirring of the spirit, just the stirring of the emotions, but, uh, that our, our souls would, would be ministered to and built up, and we would have an endurance for the fight and the race that you have given your body to run. Please help me as I stand that this afternoon that I will do so with the sole desire of honor and glorifying you, uh, that, that whatever is done this afternoon, that, that by, at my expense, that you would be honored and glorified, and your church would be ministered to thankful as always that I can have confidence in your Holy Spirit to bring that about. Please help us as we look to your scriptures to understand them, uh, not to, to take them out of context or twist them into some uh, other message but that we would just have what you would have for us to learn uh, this afternoon. We have, as always, we pray for those who are lost. They may have a better understanding of the gospel and whatever it is that may be in the way uh, that you can help them that it would be removed. We ask these things in your wonderful and holy name we pray for so worthy. Nehemiah chapter 11. Begin reading here. Actually, I guess before we begin reading, I should give you a bit of context because the, the, the structure of this book of Nehemiah is a little different. And so I need you to rewind in your minds, and I'll help you to do it, to Nehemiah chapter 7. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 7, I understand we were there a long time ago. As I said, we spent a lot of time in 8 and 9. And so all the way back in Nehemiah chapter 7, before we read our verses for today, we're going to go back and, and read these. And so, just to get our minds in the right place, because really 8, 9, and 10 are almost like in parentheses, if you would. Uh, that there's this uh, story throughout the book of Nehemiah, a, a record of history, and they kind of like, at the end of chapter 7, pause, and then in 8, 9, and 10, it speaks of this revival in Israel. And that's where we've been stuck for quite a while. And then after the conclusion of chapter 10, it picks back up in this history and, and, and in this record. And in chapter 7 of Nehemiah, and we'll just read two verses. Don't, don't get too worried. Beginning in verse 4. 
It says, Now the city was large and great, but the people were few therein, and the houses were not built. And my God put into my heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers and the people that they might be reckoned by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy of them which came up at the first and found written therein. And so chapter 7, you notice, is a very long chapter. And so in that chapter, all the way through verse 69, that it, it, it lists uh, the genealogies. It lists the, it kept, more or less that they take a census. And they would all go in and give some gifts for the work to continue and that the houses would be rebuilt. And so in chapter 7, they kind of take a census. And all the way back then, if I'm not mistaken, we kind of compared it to the time that David would do so. So now it's vastly different. Uh, that David kind of in his pride would take a census of his army, how strong and mighty they were. And that was not pleasing to the Lord. But here, that, uh, that it was of the Lord's will that Nehemiah take a census. We talked about the structure and the organization of, of leadership in, in Israel or in Judah here, how, how necessary that was. And so they do that, and what they find is, more or less, there's just not enough people in the city. Uh, that they, they are trying to re-inhabit Jerusalem. We spoke to how important the walls were, that they were more than just some structures. This isn't, uh, they're, they're not important for you know, the same reason that Fox News stresses why we need a wall. Uh, that, that it's, it's important for a different reason, and I don't mean to, to mock politics. That's not really my goal. I'm just trying to stress that this is a different situation here. Uh, that at the rebuilding of this wall, it, it served for protection, yes, but really the primary reasoning was for Judah to understand that they were a separated group of people. We're going to talk more about that this afternoon as the chapter 11 really dives more into it. Uh, but it shows that, that there is like this, there is a physical barrier for them to see that there's also a spiritual barrier here. They are not personal. And so they come into the city, they all rebuild it. And, and remember the rebuilding of the city, it required all of these people from these different villages. The city was not inhabited, it was in ruins. And so, you know, Nehemiah didn't get to the city and there's all these people already here. He got to an abandoned, ruined city. And all of these villages, the people came out and rebuilt. And so there's really nobody there. And so, okay, we have this city that's been rebuilt. But there's nobody to uphold it. There's nobody to maintain it. You know, things are going to break back down. There's nobody here to protect it. The people, there, there were a handful of people that were staying there now, and, but it just wasn't enough. And so they, the, the closing of this book, it kind of depicts the continuation of the census that was taken in chapter 7. And, and we see that they're doing something about it. They are, what they come to do is to boost the population of Jerusalem. And so that's what we pick up in chapter 11, verse 1. It says, And the rulers of the people dwelt in Jerusalem. The rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in other cities. And the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to dwell in Jerusalem. Now these are the chief of the province that dwelt in Jerusalem. But in the cities of Judah dwelt everyone in his possession in their cities to with Israel, the priests and the Levites and the Nephilims, and the children of Solomon's servants. I'll stop reading here. The rest of the chapter, as you see, this is a pretty lengthy chapter as well. It goes on in verses 4 through verse 9, and it speaks of the, the uh, families, uh, the, the way that the commentary that I've referenced labeled as the lay families. That kind of feels a little derogatory. Uh, but more or less, it's, it's the families that don't hold any other position. And I think that's a bad thing. Right? If, if you got anything from the message this morning, you know, it's okay, not, not everybody's created equal. So not everybody's a priest, not everybody's a Levite, not everybody's a ruler, that's fine. There are families, and the city needed families. Played a very large role. And so in verses 4 through uh, 9, it, it, it lists out these families that would come back. And you go on to verse 10 through verse 14, it lists the, the priests. You go through verses 15 through 24, and it lists out the Levites and the gatekeepers. And then 25 through 36, it, it kind of transitions from the families and more speaking of these different villages and cities that belong to Judah and Benjamin. And so there is this chapter kind of an organization once again that, that they took that census in chapter 7 and they say, okay, more people need to be in Jerusalem. So here's the people that went to Jerusalem and there's this record of it. Uh, so we won't spend any time really looking into the individuals, the families, or, or anything of that nature. Uh, but we will really focus in primarily on these first two verses uh, of what's going on, what they decided to do, and how they reacted to it. I want to point some, something out. We have a pretty rare 
uh, word usage in this chapter here in verse 1. It, it, it calls Jerusalem the holy city. And I understand that this is probably something that you've heard. We, we call it the holy city. Uh, that, that, but as you look at scriptures, it's not called that in scriptures very much. To my knowledge, I think there are two in this chapter and I think two in the book of Isaiah and, and in Daniel chapter 9. I think that those are all the times, to my knowledge, that that label is applied to Jerusalem, the holy city. And so it's a very rare occurrence that we see. And I've already mentioned we see it twice in this chapter. You see it in verse 18, also referenced to be the holy city. And this chapter... It, Calling it that in this chapter, I think, is, is very intentional to show, to, to really emphasize how sanctified God's community of believers is. This isn't just Jerusalem. This isn't just some city. This is the holy city. This is where the this is where God's people are. This is this is the city pertaining to the promise. And, and I don't mean to to derail or be disrespectful towards Israel today. Uh, but most of Israel has abandoned God. Uh, that, that the, the Israel that we know of today is not in the fullness of the promise, I mean, nor was this. But, uh, that, that there, as we look to Jerusalem today, that, that there is still a great fulfillment of promise to be there, but and, and certainly it is, it is a holy city uh, in that regard, but the people there today have largely abandoned God. And this context is different. It's more than just a city. That today we go to Jerusalem, most of the folks there don't know God. In this context, they all, knew, for the most part, knew God. They had. We have read in this revival that they had. It's kind of why I'm a little more comfortable saying that. In chapters eight, nine, and ten, they had this big revival that they pledged their allegiance back to God, signed a covenant in chapter ten. And so this is more than just the city Jerusalem. It's a little different than we would think of it today. In its context, that this truly was. The, the epicenter of where God's people were. So there is this great emphasis on the sanctification of God's community of believers. And we're going to spend some time to stress how important it is that we view ourselves as such today. Uh, we aren't in Jerusalem. We're very far from Jerusalem. We don't have an epicenter. If you think of the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church kind of tries to recreate this by using the Vatican it's not. It's just not the same. We don't have a, an epicenter. We don't have a hub in which we can say here where we all are. By the grace of God, the church of God is, is spread all throughout the world. And that's a wonderful thing. It's good news. We're not at a loss. Uh, but by all means, we all belong to the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. This is a large point of stress in the New Testament during Christ's ministry. As a matter of fact, almost every single parable, including the one that we read this morning, said the kingdom of heaven is like unto this. And it's this description uh, that as you would go fast forward to as Christ was before Pilate, and Jesus would tell him that his kingdom is not up here. If his kingdom were up here, his disciples would be fighting. Uh, but that his kingdom is not up here. And speaking of the kingdom of heaven, that there is coming a day in which that kingdom of heaven will in, in its fullness be on earth. But today that there is no visible kingdom, if you will. And that the only form of the visible kingdom of heaven is the church. It is God's people. And this people, they belong to a kingdom that is not here. And this is, as I've already said, as, as we come through the Gospels, this is a major point of emphasis for Christ. And so we're going to spend some time, and before I do this, I'm very hesitant in studying for this message because I don't want to sound like a communist. I, I, we're going to spend some time differentiating our earthly kingdom from our heavenly kingdom, not necessarily in a political way. Uh, but just in, in the way of how we need, as God's people, to view the kingdom of God, I want you to understand before I start that I am so thankful to live where I live. Uh, I'm so thankful we have the freedoms that we have. As you come to the New Testament, we are commanded to pray uh, that, that God's, in my own words, God's church may live peaceably among men. So far, where we live, we're able to do that. I, I genuinely thank God for that. I love where I live. I don't want to go anywhere else on this earth. I, I want to make that clear. Uh, so, so before we get on, it's not some unpatriotic propaganda. But I do think it's, it's very important for us to consider the kingdom we actually are pledging our allegiance to. And as we come to Nehemiah, a major point of, of emphasis also all throughout Scripture here is to come to chapter 11. That holy city, 
And that is where God's people belong, that we must consider ourselves to be a citizen of God's kingdom above all else. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah 52. We're going to do some reading over here that I think will kind of broaden our context of, of the history of God's kingdom. God's kingdom has never, throughout all time, been tied to any nation that is not Israel or Judah, as of course is the, the kingdoms were split. But just because they split does not mean that, that the Lord was split. That those people were always His people, and, and of course that they're they're still His people. There are still promises to be fulfilled there. That seed of Abraham. And a whole bunch of stuff that we don't have time to, to actually get into in, in a study, today at least. That is the only tie that God has ever had on this earth to a, an established government. In Isaiah 52, we kind of read of this a little bit. Verse 1, it says, Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. This is one of those, to my knowledge, two times in the book of Isaiah that we find that phrase. O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust, arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. For thus saith the Lord God, my people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. Now therefore, what have I here, saith the Lord, that the people is, or that my people is taken away for naught? They that rule over them make them to howl, saith the Lord, and my name continually every day is blasphemed. Therefore my people shall know my name, therefore they shall know in that day that I am he that does speak. Behold, it is I. So in this address to the holy city, Jerusalem, he, he makes a statement in verse 1. Henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. And there is this kind of this hard line drawn in the sand that separates the holy city from everyone else. And in and, and reference to the uncircumcised and the unclean, I understand it by the New Testament, the New Covenant, that there is no longer a need for the circumcision of the sign of the cup. And, and again, more things that we really don't have time to get into. But the the spirit of the of the point of circumcision, uh, as Romans would put out, point out that, that uh, Abraham was not justified because he was circumcised. He believed in God, and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. And then he was circumcised. The circumcision was a sign that he was that he was kind of set apart. Much in the same way that as we, we stress the emphasis of baptism, that is an ordinance the Lord has commanded us to do. That baptism does not bring me into any covenant. Uh, that it is a, 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 a showing that I have been, by the Spirit, baptized, that I have been made one with Christ, and that I'm now a child of God. And so there's this outward showing, this outward sign, that there is something inwardly that has taken place. That's why even all the way back to Moses, Moses would stand before the people of God and tell them, circumcise ye your heart. So there's a spiritual element to this. And so there's this line drawn that says, the holy city of Jerusalem, it is for my people, it is for the people that, that are, are one with me, unified, and there shall not enter into it anyone that is not my people. That there is this, again, this strong division between the two. And he goes on to speak about some of the things that they, that they have endured. He says, Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion, for thus saith the Lord, ye have sold yourselves for naught, ye shall be redeemed without money. Uh, that he speaks of them going down into Egypt and being afflicted by the Assyrians. And as we look through the history of Scripture, we see, as we already pointed out, there is one Israel. There is one people that God puts, his, puts the importance on. There is one people that he has given an unending promise to. Just one. There are a lot of unclean nations that we see them interact with. There are plenty of heathens in Scripture. Very kind of here, we, we read of Egypt. And we can go all the way back to the times of Moses. We can even go back before then to see some of the unclean people. We can think of the daughters of Lot and all of that. But we go to Egypt, and Egypt oppressed them for over 400 years in slavery. 
and they would come out, and then they would enter into the promised land, and that there was all of those different kingdoms scattered throughout the promised land. You think of the kings of Sihon and Og, and we find the city of Jericho, and uh, there are all these people in the land that are oppressing God's people, and then that they would inherit the land, and of course that uh, the kingdoms would split, and that, that you would have Israel that would go into captivity into Assyria. That you would have Judah that would go into captivity into Babylon, and that Persia would come to take the place of that. And so we see all of these different heathen nations that God's people interact with, but there's never a single time that there is a nation that, that God now associates to an unending promise to. And that, that has never changed. That there is a, a promise given, and, and you as a child of God, that you are, we'll read some scriptures in a moment in the book of Ephesians, we're now an heir to that promise. We now are a recipient of that promise. But from a, a national perspective, that there is never a replacement, uh, really for, in, in any uh, way, shape, or form, there is never a replacement for God's holy city. And so whenever we think of this, and, and, and even another example is you go to the New Testament, you find Rome as well. So we see all these examples. And that's not to say that God can't use these nations. God uses these nations. And whenever we speak of, as I said at the beginning, I don't want us to think, even today, of our current situation in this nation that we live in, that I love, uh, that as we look here, that God has undoubtedly used this nation for the furtherance of his kingdom. He, he has used the, the free, he has put, put leaders in place that have allowed us freedom, that his church may freely spread, that he has blessed us beyond measure. Uh, that his kingdom could continue to expand, that, that uh, this country has been, in a large part, one of the greatest con contributors in, in modern history to evangelism and to, to mission work all throughout the world, that the Lord has used this nation. But I, I want us to understand that this is not God's nation in, in a sense that he has an unending promise to us. All things belong to God. But that this is not his nation, and that he is not bound to this nation in any way, shape, or form. And when he's done with it, he's done with it. That all throughout history there have been these nations. God used the Roman Empire to spread. God used the Roman Empire to spread the gospel to a degree that we it's hard for us to comprehend. It just so happened that long before Christ came, as a magnitude of a couple hundred years, that the Roman Empire was set up and was built. And for the first time in history, that there was a road system put into place that was unlike anything else. It connected all. It connected travel between all of these cities in a way that had never been done. In which case, God used that nation to freely spread His gospel at a pace that was never possible until that moment in time. That God used the Roman Empire greatly to spread His gospel. As a matter of fact, a few hundred years later, that there was a Caesar who very famously converted to, to Christianity, and the Lord blessed that, and He used that to grow His church. But whenever he was through with Rome, he was through with Rome. And Rome went away, and they're almost forever more away. And, and that all throughout time, that this has kind of been the cycle that we see. And I want us to, to, to be very careful, just as that early church at the time of around 300 AD, as the, the Roman Empire made its official religion, Christianity, it was important for the church then not to view themselves as a Roman citizen above a, a citizen of heaven. And I don't mean that it's bad to uh, please understand me. I'm not up here telling you you're wrong for being proud to be an American. I'm, I'm proud to be an American as well. I don't mean to be unpatriotic. But what we need to come to understand is that there is an emphasis on the holy city. And that holy city takes precedence above all else. If we were to compare America to anything, it would not be Israel. It would be Rome. It would be Persia. It would be Babylon. It would be Egypt. It would be Assyria. We could go on and on, but it's not the holy city. The holy city takes a prevalence and a precedence above all else. And in that holy city, all of these unclean things will never enter in. All of these problems that we are, we have here today in our nation that we're looking at in the kingdom of heaven, those things won't enter in. We won't be debating on, on the value of the human life in the, in the holy city. It's just not going to happen. That there are all these things that will not enter in. And so as God's church, there is a great importance that we see ourselves first and foremost and I am a citizen of the kingdom of God. That is the kingdom that my allegiance is entirely pledged towards. 
We are, as we've already said, we are grafted into this holy city, made one with Christ. We'll turn and read the book of Ephesians, chapter 3. than the kingdom of God is idolatry. For us to be more discouraged by how awful this nation is, that, that or so discouraged that it just shuts us down and makes us give up and say, well, what's the point? And, and we, we, we shut down the work of the kingdom, that's idolatry. That, that, that there is a degree in which we, we almost align ourselves more to our earthly kingdom than we do to our heavenly kingdom. And when we do this, that, that becomes a form of idolatry that we, we need to guard ourselves against. It was important for Israel to guard themselves against it in Nehemiah's day. I don't want you to think I'm just pulling this out of nowhere. Kind of the context of why things were being done, I think it's a very valuable lesson for us to learn today. And so here in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, or how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. As we speak of how important that holy city is, and we look at it in the Old Testament, and it is important for us to see that that holy city is the city that I too belong to. Whenever I read of those, those that promise that, that we read of in Isaiah 52, very, very strongly put as always in the book of Isaiah, uh, speaking how that no unclean thing will enter in, and that, that he says to shake off the dust, and, and he reminds them that that is his people, and that is his city, and it will thrive forever. And, and we read of these promises in the book of Daniel, how that, that kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and never comes to an end. As we come to the, the Gospels and we read of his kingdom that will, will, will never come to an end, that, that will rule over all things. We go to the book of uh, Revelation, and we see all throughout scriptures this depiction of this millennial reign, and, and all of these, the, the, these things that we're looking forward to, we understand that even though I have no, to my knowledge, no, no Jewish... Uh, uh, blood and inside of me, uh, although that I'm not a descendant fleshly of Abraham, that I have been grafted in by the Spirit of God through Jesus Christ to be a recipient of that. That, that what they are identifying at to, I identify to. That, as we read, Nehemiah does a very beautiful job of portraying, I think of that verse that we read a couple chapters ago, in which they clave, they would just cleave to one another. That it shows this beautiful depiction of God's family coming together and uplifting one another and identifying to amidst all of the exile that they have undergone for over a century now, all of the hardship that they come together, they cleave to one another, and they look back and they say, God made an unending promise to us a few centuries ago, 
and he promised that he would bring it to pass, and they look forward to it, that I could join in with them as a child of God and look forward to the very same promises. I can look to the, all the times in the book of Isaiah that, that God looks to his people, and more in my own words, much less beautifully and powerfully than Isaiah would put it, that they just need to calm down. The Lord's aware of what's going on, and he's not going to fail in his promise. They have something to look forward to. They have an identity, and we have the very same identity above all else. There is no other kingdom that's going to stand forever. And so as we, we look to, to that verse 1, that that's really really drives home this point that's being made in Nehemiah of a holy city. We also see what happens is that because it's uninhabited, uh, that they would draw uh, draw lots. And that's not something that we do today. We, by the Holy Spirit indwelling all believers, that we no longer have a need for such a thing, but they were not wrong for doing so. Uh, more or less that, that uh, you might think of it as drawing sticks, that, that, that they would have... Ten, ten, or drawing straws. They'd have ten straws, and you know, one person got the short one. Uh, that the person that got the short one would have to go live in Jerusalem. Uh, so that that one out of every ten would have to go. And so that's how the, this was divvied up. And, and as they went, that they didn't go hanging their head. Uh, they they didn't go with a bad attitude. That they they went willingly. And that's kind of uh, what it says in verse two. But do notice that there is a great sacrifice that's involved post the census. They saw that there was not enough, as we saw, and that the vast majority of the people were settled in the surrounding areas. They notice what they left. To, they they just left. They're, they're kind of used to a village life, and we'll put it in a little bit more modern terms. That imagine for for you, for the sake of God's church, that uh, we were talking at lunch about all these cities that we all hate. And I'm, I'm with you. I hate it. I'm living in one now. I hate it. I hate that place. Jackson, Mississippi is terrible. Uh, that you, know, you make mention of Memphis, you make mention of Atlanta, whatever you think of your least favorite city. I guess maybe not your least favorite. I'm just thinking city life in general. And, and that, that we are, all of God's people gather together and they say, okay, we need people in Jackson, Mississippi. Who's going to go? And we all draw straws and you get the straw. Just imagine the, the shock. Imagine the, the culture change. You've been, all of you, about like me, You've been living in the same area almost all your life. I've, I've never lived outside of Stone County for any reasonable amount of time. I'm traveling back and forth to school, but that's about it. That's my home. I don't like it anywhere else. The, the few the few extended stays I've had in other places, I don't like it. I didn't like living in Starkville. I hated that place. I don't like living in Jackson. I hate that place. I don't like going on vacation for longer than a week. About day four or five, I'm ready to be home. That's just what I'm used to. That's my, 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 my property. That's, that's where, where I was raised. That's where I'm familiar. That's where I'm comfortable. And these people left that to go to a different style of life. Maybe it wouldn't have been so bad if I went off to school, you know, somewhere in the middle of nowhere and had some property and some space. I was living in an apartment. That's, that's a different change of pace. Living in an RV park. There's an, I hear everything that's going on. That's just different to me. I don't have the privacy that I'm used to having. And that's kind of what's happening here. They're used to the village lifestyle where maybe they've got, you know, pretty good distance between them and everybody else. And they're taken and dropped into a city and all these houses right next to each other. The, the, I don't want us to, to just blow right over the sacrifice that that involves. To uproot everything that they're used to, everything that they're comfortable with, and turn it on its head. And they did so willingly. They did so almost joyfully. That this is overwhelmingly showing the importance of the community of God above the individual child of God, that they would all go. It takes sacrifice to build up God's community. As we look on to verse 6, there are a couple of depictions that we'll read. Verse 6 of Nehemiah 11, it says, All the sons of Perez, I said I was going to uh, spare you me mispronouncing these names. Most of them, but some of them I'm going to have to try all the sons of Perez that dwelt at Jerusalem were 403 score and eight valiant men. That is men, valiant men. Uh, as you go down to, let me see if I can find it here. Verse 8. It says, And after him, Gabbai, Salai, 920 and 8. I put the wrong verse down. There's somebody else, somewhere else in here, that, and I'm not even going to sit here and try to find it. I wrote the wrong number down. So it's going to take my word for it. It either says men of valor or valiant men. And we go on down to verse 14, hopefully. It says, and their brethren, 
mighty men of valor. And 120 and 8, and their overseer was Zabdiel, the son of one of the great men. When we read of these mighty men of valor, and these valiant men, he's not talking necessarily about big, strong boys. He's talking about brave men. And that's kind of the, the celebration that's heaped on these people that are willing to go, that they are brave men, they are selfless men, they are with men, men who are, are worth holding in high regard. But my mind, go, for the sake of time, we won't turn and read uh, either of the scriptures I'm about to reference. But in the book of Philippians, in chapter 2, that there are two men, Timothy and Epaphroditus, that come up. And it, with, with both of these men, that, that they're, Paul kind of portrays them as men worthy of praise. Well, why is that? That it speaks of Timothy and his willingness to, uh, to more or less care for that church as he would care for his own self. And that's his desire to send Timothy there. And it speaks of Epaphroditus that came from Philippi to deliver the gift that they had sent to Paul and became sick unto death. And for, his, for the sake of God's kingdom, literally put his life on the line and did it with joy. And, he, and Paul more or less sets these two men aside and says, hey, these are men that are worth giving honor to. These are good men. And we go to the book of Hebrews, and the whole book of Hebrews is kind of uh, heaping praise on these, these men, it says, and of whom the world was not worthy. Uh, that, that is kind of God's view towards them. It speaks of those that were hiding in rocks and caves and uh, wearing sheepskins and goatskins, men that, that weren't really all held to a high, high regard. Some of them were. Abraham and Moses and some of these men were kind of celebrated and, uh, and, and very wealthy. But not all of them are. It's that, that there were many that were, were that had their lives forcibly taken from them. Some that were sawn asunder. Many that would suffer uh, for the sake of Christ. But God would say that they are all, because of their good report of faith, that the world was not worthy of them. And it speaks very highly of these men. This is a very noble, good thing to sacrifice for the sake of God's community. And that is what it demands and that's what needs to be celebrated, and celebrated they did. If you look back in Nehemiah, chapter 11, verse 2, it says, And the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. It, it shows this genuine love that they had towards one another. There's no envy towards one another. There's no skepticism. There, there, there's none of that. There's not, oh, they think they're all high and mighty for going to Jerusalem. They think they're, they're better than everybody else. There's no, well, let's see how that works out for them. There's none of that. It's, it's joy. That there are those that go and there are those that don't. And that as we looked at this morning, it's, you know, there's a diversity of things for a reason. It was God's will for some to go. And it was God's will for others to stay. And for those in whom it was God's will to go, they went willfully. And everybody else celebrated. Everybody else that it was God's will to not go. That they blessed them. That, that they really contributed to them that God could be further served. And I think this is another interesting point to bring out that there are, as we, we've already mentioned, it is not God's will for you to do everything. But for the areas in which it is not God's will for you to serve, it is absolutely his will for you to contribute to the one serving in that capacity. And as an example, what I mean by this, it is not, so, so far in my knowledge at this present moment in time, it is not God's will for me to be a missionary. It's just not. But it's God's will for me to support our missionaries and support them, I do. And that we're all to do. It's probably not God's will for you to be in the Philippines. It's Brother George Hill's will to be in the Philippines. Or God's will for Brother George Hill to be in the Philippines. And so it is then his will for you to support him. To bless him for it. He goes. You stay. That's all well and good. But it is still a, this, of this community a need to bless. I think we see a couple of good examples of this and even here. Uh, that that by, by my account, that as y'all are all aware, I, I grew up at Social Baptist Church. I haven't been there in some time. Every now and then, I, I pop in and say hello, but, but I have not contributed to serving in that local body in two and a half years or so now. But still, to this day, that that at every opportunity they have, they're a blessing to me. At, at every opportunity they have, they're praying for me. That there are still plenty of them there that text me on a regular basis. To encourage me uh, to meet our needs, and similarly, as I, and, and it, you know, it wasn't for them to be sent out, but it was for them to be a blessing to me as I was sent out, and they have done a, a fantastic job of it. And similarly, for for you here, that it is not your job as an individual to stand in this position. You all have blessed me mightily for doing so. Uh, that as an example, I don't say this. I got a lot of comments last week, kind of of the. Uh, uh, and, and understand where it's coming from uh, 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 Kind of feeling bad for me for, for kind of what I had to do last week and I kept telling you don't worry about me I'm fine And I'm a blessed, 
what I had to do last week was a byproduct of like a million different ways that God has blessed me. I, I promise. There, God has answered a million different prayers, that, and a byproduct of that was having to drive a little bit more last week. I'm thankful for it. And so I don't mean to say this to, 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 to say woe is me, but rather to, to, to thank the church and their blessing me for having to do what they didn't have to do. Y'all did not, I think I, I totaled it up, about 1,800 miles I drove last week. About $300 in gas. But y'all, what y'all put in the offering more than made up for what I had to spend in gas. It wasn't your will to have to spend that money, but it was God's will. It wasn't God's will for you to spend that money. It was God's will for you to support me, and you did. And I thank you for that. that, that is, that's, that's how things ought to be. I think a lot of times, and I want to be fully transparent, the reason I bring this up is to say thank you, to say very well done on this job. And when we come and read scriptures, I think a lot of times we, we maybe I approach it from the perspective of you need to do this better, you need to do this better. And we can probably do all things better. But I do want to take a moment to, to say well done. That's how these things are to go. It's not God's will for you to do everything, but it is His will for you to support, and you've done a, a very wonderful job of that. And, and that is kind of what we see in this community. I don't know in what ways these people blessed these men that willingly offered themselves, but I would imagine that there was some, some, some needs that were probably met, uh, some things that were needed for the journey that, that their neighbors say, well, I don't have to go, but here's some bread. I don't have to go. Uh, but, but here's some tools. Here's something that, that you may need once you get there. I don't know in what ways that it went, they went about it. But I would imagine that, that it, was, it involved offering themselves up to bless those that went on their behalf. And we see a great picture of the community of God coming together to support one another. But also inhabiting the city. You see it in the book of Philippians chapter 4. At the end of the book that, that, that Paul speaks about uh, having these needs. And that the Philippians communicated with his needs. That they sent that gift by Epaphroditus. That, that, and he was blessed. That by that gift, they communicated with his needs. That they met all the needs that Paul had. And he thanks the Lord, saying, not that I speak in respect of one, but, but that he was very appreciative that the church saw fit to meet his need. You go to the book of 2 Timothy, and Paul is very thankful that, that he has Timothy. Paul is coming to the end of his life. He's passing the torch on, so to speak. And he sees a faithful man younger than him who is able to continue the work of the church. And he thanks God upon every remembrance of him. And then he even mentions his mother and grandmother that they were faithful, that they raised Timothy to be faithful, and he's thankful for them. And we talk about this, you know, it wasn't God's will for, uh, for, for Eunice to, to be Paul, but it was God's will for her to raise up Timothy, who loved and cared for the Lord, who could continue the work that Paul started. And she did that work, and she was congratulated for it forevermore in scriptures. And it seems like such a... a I'm sure at the time it seemed like such a, a small thing, but it, it ended up becoming such a large thing. And so we see that, yes, there are some that are to go, there are some that are to stay, but that all are to contribute to the work. We see a beautiful picture of that in this chapter. And so it is so necessary that we would cleave to one another, as it says in the book of Nehemiah, and that we would do so in allegiance and service for God's kingdom above all else in life. This will be the message. Well, for